Derek Gordon with Density, and uh, I'm here for our co-founder. Our co-founder and CEO, Andrew Farah, had planned to be here with you all today, but was waylaid by a last-minute situation. So in his place, I will tell you three of his favorite stories and how history can inspire better spaces for the future. So number one, what's past is prologue. In World War II, there were 15 German cities that were firebombed. Out of their rubble emerged a rare opportunity. As grim as it was, Germany had been given a chance to start from scratch, to rethink how cities and buildings should work. In 1958, two brothers, Ebhardt and Wolfgang Schneller, felt office space should facilitate creativity well-being and health. This was a major departure from the lifeless grid of offices born of manufacturing that workers back then were used to. The brothers moved managers out of private offices and put them on the open floor. They used plants to separate people and added movable screens to help with focus and communication. It was way ahead of its time, like 75 years ahead. They called this innovative approach the Organic Office Landscape, or Bürolandschaft. Bürolandschaft. It was a brilliant design, fast, effective, inexpensive, and scalable, and it spread across Europe. The movement inspired an American named Robert Probst. Working with Herman Miller, he designed something called the Action Office. This is this uh, comfortable little command center you see here. Uh, Probst also believed the office should be about movement and that work out of sight was work out of mind. This meant standing desks and no large drawers for stuff to get lost in. But he and Herman Miller had over-engineered the furniture. It was all just a little too expensive to scale. Although the action office failed to achieve Germany's dream of dynamic, organic space, it succeeded in remaking 40% of all American workplaces. How, you ask? Well, the action office is the inspired forefather of the action office too, or as it's more commonly known, the cubicle. What's important here is that the ideas were right, balance, movement, wellness, focus, shared space. We just got the implementation wrong. Story number two, the internet Coke machine. The third floor of Wien Hall is home to the computer science department of Carnegie Mellon and to a Coke machine that once had the highest sales volume in America in the 1970s in the greater Pittsburgh area at that particular university. Never mind, it doesn't matter. Just know it's a great Coke machine with a storied history. Anyway, the denizens of Wien Hall were engineering students and they loved ice cold Coca-Cola. Here's a fun fact. Apparently the optimal temperature to serve Coke is 38 degrees Fahrenheit, just above freezing. Anyway, late each night, these students would saunter down to the third floor, grab a drink, and get back to work. At the time, CMU's computer science department has started to expand, pushing grad student offices further and further away from the Coke machine. In the mid-70s, there were fewer than 300 computers worldwide on ARPANET. That's the original internet but its use and utility was expanding rapidly. The personal computing boom of the 1980s was just around the corner. Now, there's this cool concept in software design. It's clever, but doesn't seem to have a, normal name, a formal name. Uh, essentially, you take a feature away from a user to see how much they miss it. If they miss it a lot, you're probably onto something. Well, CMU, inadvertently ran this experiment on its engineers and accidentally invented what we now call the Internet of Things. As the distances between grad student and caffeine grew, a new pro problem arose. 
back then, the machine was sporadically refilled by student volunteers. The machine's popularity and irregular refilling schedule meant long walks to find empty Coke slots or worse, warm Coke. Tired of finding an empty machine, the students decided this grievance was a bridge too far. They installed micro switches inside the vending machine that would sense how many bottles were present. And then, of course, because why not, they connected it to ARPANET. The machine could now tell if a bottle was present and how long it had been there. This data was fed into a software program that allowed anyone on ARPANET to query the real-time avail availability of an ice-cold Coca-Cola. It's important in moments like these to remember that laziness can be a remarkable motivator, that necessity is the mother of invention, and that most great things start small. 50 years later, there are 46 billion things connected to the internet. And a Coke machine was among the very first. Story number three, people are weird. A few months ago, our founder, my friend and boss and CEO, Andrew, was on a call. He had decamped from his desk and co-opted a large conference room it's always the large one. It's not clear what this particular call was about or who he was talking to or what was said. In fact, if Andrew hadn't pointed out that the shapes I'm about to play uh, were indeed him, we wouldn't have known. However, in this case, we know Andrew likes whiteboards and he likes to pace when he talks a lot. It turns out Andrew's not the only one that does strange stuff in built spaces. Sometimes people walk in different directions. Sometimes they linger or bring stuff with them like televisions and giant trash cans. And sometimes they're actually dogs. The built world is big. There is 6.1 billion square feet of new construction every year. To put that in perspective, 6.1 billion square feet is the equivalent of three New York cities built anew every year. There isn't a rule book for how to use a building. There isn't a guide on the right way to use a city. Designers, politicians, city officials, and citizens take a best guess at what people need and what they might want. And then, people just vote with their feet. In fact, most cities evolve over or on top of existing infrastructure. They reuse routes designed for a previous era's form of transportation. If you look at an aerial view of most cities, they will exhibit what looks like a scar tissue. Roman Mars of 99% invisible has a funny term for this. When old routes slice against the grain of a city's new and modern grid, he calls it scar architecture. Our cities are spectacular agents of efficiency and innovation but they also come at a cost. Between construction and standard operation, buildings account for 39% of global carbon emissions. The world's buildings are worth $280 trillion. That number is so large that to count it, you know, like one, two, three, four, you would have to live 93,000 lifetimes. The built world is beautiful, expensive, necessary, flawed, inspired, and vast. And we know nothing about how it's used. We don't know when people linger or the paths they take. We don't realize how much space we don't use and don't need, or maybe only need sometimes. We don't realize the stories that people are telling us just by living and working 
in the buildings and cities we've built. So the question I'd like to leave with you today is this. What would happen if buildings were like Coke machines? If space was designed for movement and focus and creativity? What if we all had the privilege of a Burrowlandschaft? What would happen if New York City knew how it was used? I think that we'd be happier and more productive. And I think New York would probably design itself pretty differently. And whatever is true for New York would probably be true for San Francisco and Denver and Boston. It would be true for Toronto and Paris, for Berlin and Tokyo, Mexico City and Mumbai. Whatever is true for one major city would be true for all the rest. I wonder what a wonder it will be when we can measure all these untold stories and work to improve our footprint on the world. Thank you.